Hey family, thank you for tuning in to today's message. I believe that this message is going to bless you and is going to empower you. And so I pray that you are blessed and given the tools that you need to grow and thrive in your relationship with God. Enjoy. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord God of Israel. You alone are worthy, you alone are worthy. And Father, as we come together today to explore your word, to learn more about you, to discover more of the truth about your son, Jesus the Christ, we thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who will breathe upon these words and bring them to life as he has been doing for all of eternity. Holy Spirit, come. Come and create. Come and draw upon our hearts. Come and paint upon the canvas of our imagination that we may know the truth and the truth shall set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How are we doing? We good? A little bit tender after a three-week fast or whatever? <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? You come to the end of the fast and immediately you want to look in the mirror and go, did it work? Did it? I'm joking. That's not what it's about. Um, but it is interesting that you are not the only church who had to extend their fast. We did it as well. We, we were supposed to finish last week. And then we got to Sunday and then our church was like, nah, we ain't done. Um, it was actually, I was just saying earlier, it was the first fast that I believe actually we called for, like the church community, the congregation. Um, usually it's pastor who comes and says, right, January we're fasting, and he announces it maybe late December. But from about late November, early December, we were already in a situation where we finished one service, um, I think it was the first week of December, and a bunch of us leaders just said, we need to fast. We need to do this. Um, and the reality of the situation is, and if, if anyone studies any of the prophetic words that have been spoken over London recently, is that God is here, revival is here. And something's about to hit this city um, in a real new, fresh way. Um, and so a lifestyle of fasting, and I mean that, a lifestyle of fasting, you're looking at me funny, is that, <laughs> did you not like that word? <clears throat> is something that I encourage everyone to develop. The Lord took me on a, on a journey a few years back now where he said to me, he said, I'm going to teach you how to fast. Um, it wasn't easy, but I had to do it, and I'm glad I did, um, because it has released so much power in life. Um, today, as, as you may know, we're going to talk about worship. Um, this was on my heart from last November when I came here, I think, with um, Brother Sam. And there was a session that we had where the worship went on, and I know this is something that happens anyway. And the Lord began to speak to me, and he just said to me, like, tell them to be comfortable with extended periods of worship. And I, I believe I did come up and share that. Um, but with all these things, I don't want to just release it and then not teach, because I feel like that's what we do a lot in church. And a lot of the time, we're very well-spoken in the Christianese around worship, around revival. We say that word revival. We say all these different words. Um, and, and, but we don't really necessarily have the ground in to understand what's happening. And it'd be foolish for us just to have one or two, three, four people in the room who have a revelatory understanding of these terms. And we're trying to steer 30, 40, 50, 5,000 people in a particular direction. It's, that's the old model. Now I believe the Lord is raising up people where everyone is... is attuned to what the Lord is saying and about a particular thing. So when these moments occur, the worship leader doesn't have to do all the heavy lifting. The worship leaders in the room say amen. amen. <laughs> right? No more heavy lifting. No more, and the, the keyboardist is not having to put an extra pad on just to make you feel like God is in the room. But we'll, be, we'll have the sensitivity to understand that when, we're, when he's moving and when he begins to move us into things of, of the unknown, we're going to talk a little bit about that, that's where we feel comfortable. Um, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm comfortable, I'm comfortable. 
with the unknown. I'm comfortable with the unknown. Um, so in one of those sessions last year, that's, that's what I, I said, that you know, you'll need to be comfortable with extended periods of worship. This may include prophetic song. This may include silence. This may include worship without words. Um, all must be embraced as long as you are following the wind of the Spirit at all times. I want to thank you guys, those of you that submitted questions to the form that came out. Um, those questions were incredible. Um, they made me do some homework. Um, and actually, my plan was to incorporate the answers to those questions in this sermon, but I felt like the Lord was taking in a particular direction which didn't quite correlate. So what I have done, I have uh, recorded a video last night um, that the pastors will send out at some point, either today or, or in the week, I know they're away, um, but they're always working. <laughs> some of the conversation I've had this week, I'm like, brother, you're not going away. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, you know, we'll send that out and it will have the answers to those questions or my perspective and some steering for you guys. Because it's impossible to speak on worship and summarize it in an hour, okay? To be honest, it's impossible for me to talk about anything in an hour. So pray for me. Um, as you guys know, I'd like to go on because I'm going to try to stick to these notes as best as possible. Um, but worship is something that, um, you know, I could spend 10 weeks and still only have gone through just the first bits of the Hebrew, okay? So I'm just going to give you a taster. But hopefully the taste is sweet enough that it gets your, your taste buds going. I know it's something to say after a fast, isn't it? <laughs> All these images and analogies, it's probably not the best thing to say. Um, but hopefully it teases you into, into pursuit, okay? And that's something that you find with worship, that worship begets worship that um, Moses proved this in Exodus 33 when the scripture says that he would go into the tent of meeting and meet with God face to face as a man would speak with his friend. And then the scripture goes on to say that as the people saw the cloud descend upon Moses, they stood up to worship. So when they witnessed him in a moment of intimacy, it produced worship in them, okay? Worship leading 101. Just showcase intimacy you don't even have to sing a song. Just the very fact you live in intimacy is enough to draw it out of someone else. Okay? So, everything God does is according to a pattern and based on principle. And the first thing I want to talk about is a seminal moment in the story of worship. A life-changing moment. A moment where worship was changed forever. And to do that, we're going to go to Matthew 27, verse 50 to 51. Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51. Got an email earlier this week. Oh, could you send your scriptures in? I had to pick and choose which ones I wanted. <laughs> Matthew 27, verse 50 to 51. And it says here, Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. In some translation, it says, He cried out with a loud voice and died. 51, and at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart. Okay? Can we just highlight that bit there? From top to bottom. Say that again. Say it out loud. From top to bottom. Why is that significant? Okay? Because when the temple had these veils and there were certain parts you couldn't go into, only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, and even he could only go once a year. He would go, I think it was on the Day of Atonement, and he would offer up a sacrifice, and as long as the blood hit the mercy seat and God was okay, um, he would put off the quote-unquote judgment until the following year. And now we have Jesus, who we know later on in the scriptures referred to as our high priest, and he's there on the cross, at a moment of which, is, which time literally is, is based around this moment. Our lives are based around this moment. He's on the cross and he's fulfilling all these prophecies. Filling, I can't remember how many. There's hundreds of prophecies have been fulfilled in that one uh, moment there on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama back for me. You know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms 22. It's got all these different moments have been expressed. And then there's this. From top to bottom. One preacher that I heard, I can't remember who it was, said it was as if God took his own finger and ripped it. 
See, it couldn't be from bottom to up. Because to do that would imply that it's coming from us. This had to be from him. Because this was always the plan. It was always the plan that man would have full access to the presence of God. That's why um, the writer in Hebrews says, boldly come before the throne of grace. Okay? It was never God's intention for there to be a separation between man and him. How do we know that? Adam. Adam walked in complete union with God. Even when he sinned, God's first response was to come and find him. God still was like, well, we've got a reservation, so I'm still coming to have this date. Adam, where are you? Oh, you're not in the usual spot. But God's reaction has always been intimacy. His choice has always been closeness. His choice has always been nearness. His choice has always been union. It's a key word. It's a word I'm obsessed with now. And the more I see it throughout scripture, union has always been about us and him being one. That's why Jesus, the son of God, prayed in John 17, 22. And he said that. He said, that they may be one even as we are one. That tells me it's the heart of God that we are one. And, and I also have the confidence to say that God's response, the father's response to this prayer was, yeah, okay. So we don't have to exist with any sense of separation or distance from the Father. And it happened in this place of worship, the temple, which was the heart of worship for the Jewish community. Can you imagine the shock on their face? Could you imagine the high priest? Because the high priest, I don't know if you know, they were selected every number of years, right? So imagine you were the high priest and it's on your shift when this happens. Like for however many hundreds of years, the veil had just been there. Right? It never split, there was no rock shaking, no whatever, you know, and there was a distance between and only I can go in and I have and even when the high priest had to go in, I don't know if you know this, the high priest, when he went in, he had to have bells round his his um his feet, I think it was, or his waist. Because if the presence of God consumed him and he collapsed, they would hear. Right? But also when the blood hit the mercy seat and he began to shuffle backwards and come out of the presence of God, right? you then hear the sound of him approaching. That's why when Pentecost happened and the blood had hit the mercy seat, Jesus had put the blood on the mercy seat and the high priest, what did we hear? They heard a sound as of a rushing wind. All these types and shadows throughout scripture. Okay? So at the cross, worship was changed forever. The book of Romans is, is very interesting in, in its... In its um, Speech and the pattern of Romans is very similar to the pattern of um, many of Paul's, Paul's writings. The first 11 chapters are a deep dive, if you ever studied it, into the plan of redemption. Okay? People say it's one of the finest uh, letters ever written, one of the finest pieces of work from that time. And what Paul does, he takes you step by step. Chapter 1, 2, 3 talks about the depravity of man and how all of us need Jesus. Okay, all of us need help. All of us need saving. Goes into chapter 4, what did our father Abraham find? Starts talking about faith. Goes into 5. Um, 5 expounds on that and begins to talk about the grace of God. Okay, and talks about how the Holy Spirit causes the love of God to share, be shed aboard in our hearts. Go into verse six, chapter 6 and chapter 7. Then you have this tension. Yeah, okay, right, I'm loved by God, I'm, I'm saved, uh, but I'm this sin thing. What do I do with sin? Okay, so it's talking about that in Romans 6 and 7. We get to 8, right, and it says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it's talking about sonship. And 9 and 10 and 11 begin to expound on what that looks like and how we can engage with that revelation. And then 12 opens up with this fantastic line. Now... In view of God's mercies, offer up everything as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable act of worship. Reasonable act of worship is to give everything. Right? But the only way you can do that is in view of God's mercies. Don't miss out that first line. It's not just a connection. Right? It's important that we, we bear that in mind. So what's he saying? Paul is saying, 
check out these 11 chapters I've already written and this story, this narrative I've, I've woven, I've included the Jews, the Gentiles, no one's missed out, male, female, I've covered every base you can imagine. And I've shown you and I've proven over 11 chapters that the only response, the only, sorry, the only solution to the human condition is Jesus. So now that I've shown you all this, worship. I've shown you all of this. Now worship. Live in response to that moment we just detailed when he hangs his head and he dies for us. The all-encompassing love of God, which is on show, the all-encompassing grace of God, which captured every single one of us and said, yeah, I'm not going to let you go. I know you've been running. I know you've been wrestling but I'm not going to give up on you I'm not going to give you an opportunity to doubt me that grace live in reaction to that in view of God's mercies and the only natural response is to offer up everything we understand that from Genesis 22 the first time worship is ever mentioned in the scripture okay Abraham God says I want you to go and offer up your son as a sacrifice Abraham, a few verses later, says to his servant, stay here, me and the lad are going to go and worship. I'm sorry, what? Because God told you to sacrifice. You translated that and said worship. So worship and sacrifice have always been linked. That's why David in something 24, I think it might be 1 Samuel 24, one of them, you guys can do your research. Um, David turns around and says, I'm not going to offer up to God something that costs me nothing. And then we see here, at the ultimate sacrifice, worship is changed. So worship and sacrifice go hand in hand, yes? Do you know what's even more interesting? All those things happen in the same mountain range. Abraham, Mount Moriah, David, it was just outside of Jerusalem, which is where Mount Moriah was. Jesus, the same mountain. So in three times over the course of about 6,000 years, the Father took that mountain range and he said, I'm going to prove to you that worship has always been about sacrifice. It's interesting because Psalms 87 too says, The Lord loved the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Israel. Okay? There's something about worship that he just loves more than anything else. Whatever house you want to build, let it be a house of worship. He can't stay away from sounds made in his name. Right? Any description of heaven that you see and, and read in the scripture, or maybe you, have, you know people who've been up to heaven and they've seen visions or whatever, the one consistent thing, you may not have seen the cherubim, but you saw worship. You may not have seen Gabriel, Michael, or the dons, but you saw worship. He chooses to surround himself with worship. He chooses to hide, that's what Habakkuk says, the hiding place of his power is the presence, the presence of God is the hiding place of his power. He chooses to hide his power in the place of worship. Eden means the place of presence, the place of pleasure. It was a place of worship. That's where he placed mankind. And at the moment when Jesus offered up his life, worship transformed forever. So it shows us how incredibly important to the Father worship is. Bill Johnson said this, it is the privilege of the believer to minister to the Lord. Now, in church, we're taught how to minister for the Lord. How many of us know how to minister to the Lord? Lord, how do I minister to you? How can I meet your needs? It's an incredible statement to have in your prayer life, isn't it? Especially because he's going to answer you. <laughs> Well, how can I position myself and, and, and whatever worship looks like, whatever it is, and whatever, to minister to you? Let's go to First John four nineteen. We love each other because he first loved us. Okay, we've all heard this scripture. Um, I think I even quoted it near the end of last year, one of the times I was here. We love because he first loved us. Okay. 
Now, there are many definitions you can have for worship. You can go into the Greek um, from John 4, 23. You know, it says um, worship in spirit and in truth. The word there, worship, is the word proskuneo in the Greek. Um, if I was to demonstrate what worship, what that word means, I'd have to get my wife up on to the stage to, to show you what it means. Because it means to lean intently as if to kiss upon the cheek. Now, that, that rocked my world when my dad told me that 20 years ago, right? To, to worship in spirit and in truth is to lean intently as if to kiss upon the cheek. Other renditions of that word is to prostrate oneself, to bow down. But the common understanding would have been the intensity of that bowing, the intensity of that prostration is as if you were about to kiss. Right? You know when you're a kid and you saw a kissing scene on TV? Maybe, I don't know, some of your parents didn't let you watch this stuff. <laughs> but you know you kind of... Or if your mum and dad kiss, you're like, guys, come on. Because the intensity of that makes you uncomfortable if you're not in the loop. Because when you got big and you had your relationship, come on, we could be honest, right? <laughs> and that first boyfriend or first girlfriend was there, you're at the train station, you're like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> cool, cool. You know, a little sneaky kiss after school. Maybe it was university for some of you, I don't know. But it, it, the feeling and the intensity of that moment and that desire you may, it may not have even been on the cards before. You're just chatting. You're just having a chat. And then all of a sudden, you want to kiss. You, and then it, you, you act on it. That's what worship is. It's kind of uncomfortable, but that's it. That's the intensity. I wasn't even thinking about that. Lord, I adore you. Even when I came up, I was planning to sing a different song. And then she started playing. I was like, oh, okay, we're here. And there was an intensity that her worship sparked in me. As she worshipped and she had her moment of kissing him, I went, oh, I, I want to kiss him as well. And then maybe some of you went, oh, I wasn't even about to sing. I was about to sit down, but I, I now have to, I'm going to join in because it's lovely, isn't it? It's sweet, it's pure, it's, it's right. It's where I should be. We love because he loved us first. This is my definition of worship at the moment. This may change in six days' time, six years' time, 60 years' time. But for me right now, this is my definition of worship. Worship is the object of love returning love to the one who is love. Worship is the object of love returning love to the one who is love. Okay? Okay? So I'm there, right? And I am the object of his love. And so I return that love to him. Because he is love. So it's this circle of love, this exchange of love. It may be a song, but it usually isn't. Because you do not spend 90% of your time singing. Unless you are a full-time singer. Nope. Okay. So when you're in the office and you're filling out that form that came through and you're doing it in the right spirit, that's an act of worship. Because you're doing it in a way that brings on own glory to your father. Instead of cussing out that manager, the fact that you held your tongue and you chose to bless them when you could have cursed them that is an act of worship. This is what Romans 12 says. In view of his mercy, in view of the cross, I'm going to choose to bless, not curse. And that is me showing him that we are one. That we are intimate. That your thoughts are my thoughts. Really? Can I say that? Because I know in the scripture it says that his thoughts are far above our thoughts. Right? It says in scripture, his ways are far above our ways. I know, I know it does. It also says that in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, it says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for those who love him. And then the next verse says, but it has been revealed to us. So that tells me the things that I used to think were always outside of my own remit, I can now engage with them. Why? 
because we're one. How many of you got older siblings? How many of you went to the same school as your older sibling? How many of you felt a sense of confidence when you were in that school with your older sibling? This, this is exactly how I feel. Work cannot intimidate me because I'm one. And that is my worship. And that's why I spend more time obsessing about his obsession than I do obsessing about such and such person at work or situation that I'm facing. And actually, I learn how to engage with his presence the more I turn and face him now that the veil has been torn in two. And think about it. It cost a man his life for me to have this access. So I would want to take it up. I don't, want to, I don't want his sacrifice to go to waste. He's made a way that every single second of my life from this point on to eternity, I can be one with him. And that's my goal. That's what I'm moving towards. That there was never a moment where me and him have any separation. As soon as he says something, I hear it and I can say it. If I ever needed to know what he was thinking, I, I can just access Am I there yet? No. There are some times where I'm out of sync. But it's not because he moved. <laughs> like I said, he shows up. Garden of Eden, he showed up. I'm here. This is where we always meet. <laughs> I don't know where you're at. We, re we return this love to the one who loved us first. This word first in that scripture, 1 John 4.19, is the Greek word protos, P-R-O-T-O-S. And it talks about the first in rank, and the first in influence. His love is the first love. His love is the first love. And we always talk about returning to our first love. And we always see it our way to him. Maybe that's not where it's at. Because the moment you do that, you return into a workspace mentality. Actually, you're more better off, this is my opinion, you guys can debate it with Jesus, um, you're better off returning to a place where you just sit and say, Father, show me how much you love me. I did it this morning. Seven o'clock this morning. I felt disconnected. So I sat there, and instead of me going over my notes and going, <laughs> I've got A&T, they're, they're waiting for something, man. Gee, da, da, da. I just sat there, and I waited for him to show me. And I said, Jesus, I'm not moving until you show me how much you love me. It's been... In Pretty much the same prayer for the past three, four years since I had that encounter that I've told you guys about. And as I said, I sat there and I waited. And about two and a half minutes later, I felt this thing just start to rise up within me. I was like, okay, I'm back. That's all it took. It took silence. And my silence was more of an act of worship and an offering of worship than any song could have been. Because I could have found a song. I, could have, I love, I love, I love your presence. But that's not what was needed at that moment. What was needed was the fact that he sings to me and he says, I love, I love, I love your presence. I love hanging out with you, son. I love getting around you. I love when you call me. I've been waiting all night. You're up. <laughs> You're awake. I've got something to tell you. By the way, this is what's going to happen later on. There's some people who need to be healed. I'm going to give you some details about them. Okay, cool. I'll write it down. Lord, you tell me which, when do I go into that moment? Just wait. I'll give you the instruction. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about? Nah. Sometimes he tells me to sleep. He says, close your eyes. He said, you can go rest for the last 15 minutes. Your alarm's about to go off in 20 minutes. Just go to sleep. Yeah, but I'm supposed to be praying because I'm the man of God. <laughs> no, you're not. You're supposed to be obeying because you're a son. So I'm telling you, go to sleep. Okay, cool. So I literally, I get the cushions and just, just <laughs> I fall asleep in the presence of my father, in the arms of my father. Because which child wouldn't want to fall asleep in the arms of their father? And then usually I wake up pregnant with a idea or a scripture a truth a sermon, a song sometimes it's nothing but I obeyed because I'm living in reaction to his love 
I'm living in reaction to the cross. The cross was Jesus obeying, so I obey. The cross was Jesus heeding the word of the Father, so I do the same. It was him living in, op- operating in the, the biggest amount of submission and surrender you could ever imagine, so I do the same, because that's what we do in this family. It's a family business. And in my family, which I'm sure most of you are part of, all of you are part of this same family, this is what we do, we surrender. We submit, we obey, we heal. We go to war over principalities and powers and we smash them up, right? We reduce the crime rate in areas because we're the ones praying. We walk into rooms and all of a sudden they're transformed because all of a sudden the Prince of Peace is here. We can have a family feud that's been going on for 20 years between mum and uncle and whatever, and we intervene, and all of a sudden it's done. That's just the family business. And all those things are acts of worship. Become obsessed with his obsession. I think I might have said it here before. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it a thousand times before I'm done. Become obsessed with, with his obsession. And how do you do that, Dave? How do I do that? Well, you just sit and ask him to show you. Father, I want to become obsessed with your obsession. I want to see how much you are obsessed with me. And then you just wait. And he will show you. Some of you will feel things. That's how he does it with me. It's interesting because physical touch is my number one language of love language, right? And in the same way with, with... my interactions with Father, when I'm in the presence of God, it's all touch. It's my hands start tingling and things start burning. And, uh, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's like a weird sensation. It's like, oh, okay. But that's, he's shown me. Even when I'm preaching sometimes, I'll sense certain things. Like, oh, okay. Thank you. I remember when I first started like preaching, I used to finish... And I'd go and pray, but like, oh, Father, was that okay? <laughs> I really hope that was okay. I didn't, I didn't get through all my notes. I missed out that scripture. And I did, so did I quote that Greek right? I don't know. And he, I used to feel this touch on my shoulder. Just simple. Just <sighs> He didn't say nothing, but that touch was like, basically telling me to shut up. <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. We good. John 15, 3 to 4. And then we're also going to look at 13 to 15. 3 is, is incredible. I'm not even going to try preaching it because it will be a whole other hour. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. This is Jesus. Um, sorry, context. Um, Jesus, the scripture says, I think it's in John 14 or 13. It said, Jesus, knowing he was about to be handed up to the authorities began to share with his disciples. So this is his final speech, 13, I mean 14, 15, 16, and then he prays in 17, okay? So if you only had one more night before you're going to get arrested, right, and you're Jesus, these are the things he wants to make sure that you remember, right? Because he could have talked about anything, but he talks about this. So he says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. If any of you are wondering if you can worship because of, some of the things you might have been involved in, maybe even your past, maybe even last night or whatever, this scripture is the one that gets me all the time. Because he says, because of the word I've given you, you've already been purified. It doesn't mean that there's no room for repentance or whatever. But our starting point is pure. Our starting point is pure. You don't have to work yourself into purity to then worship the king. The veil has been torn in two. The blood has been shed. I think it's Zechariah, somewhere in the backwaters of the Old Testament. It says um, there, was, there was a spring that sh- shot up in the midst of Jerusalem. And it talks about the water that comes from the spring and how it brings cleansing. You've already been pruned and purified. You've already been cleansed by the word that's been preached to you. Okay, so your, your starting point is pure. And he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Some translations say dwell, others say abide. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. I've never linked this scripture to worship in any time I've ever preached it until today. And when I was getting ready and I was preparing, I said to my wife, I said, I actually had two messages written before 
right? I wrote the first one, because uh, I knew I was coming down here from five, six weeks ago. I wrote the first one, I looked at it, and I was like, this is not it. Scrap it, delete. I wrote the second one. Scriptures, everything had points. Tell me, I had points. <laughs> I was ready. And I read it, and I went, no. This, this is not him. And then I got to this third rendition, the third edition. The best one of all. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, so what's the, what are you saying to me? And he said, abide. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't ask them to get comfortable with extended periods of worship if they don't know how to abide. If they don't know how to dwell. Because the veil in the temple is already open. It's already torn in two, and it was never sewn back up. So there's always access. The access is not the problem. It's whether we choose to live inside or outside. The temple's there. The Holy of Holies is, is wide open. But will you, musician, will you, poet, will you, architect, walk in? Will you, financial analyst, will you, entrepreneur, will you walk in and go, this is home? And will you, live, will you live lives catered in that way? This is what fasting does. It helps push us deeper into the presence where we go, because God hasn't moved. God's always been on the throne. He's already done everything that he needed to do. It's already in his diary. He's already said, right, at the end, you win. But for him, he's like, come closer. Position yourself in and never leave. Never leave. Why? Because I don't leave. In the old, the dove would arrive and depart. Okay? In the Old Testament, if you saw the dove or the Holy Spirit, it would come upon an individual and then it would depart. In the new, he abides. Do we have verse 13 and 15 there? Of course we do. He says this, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves, our translation says servants, because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. Those who identify as servants will stay on the outside. Because you'd go in, master, what do you want? What do you want me to do? And then you leave. You'd go in and you leave. But when you're going in and out, you're going to see some other people. And I hope this is the people in A&T. And they are what we call friends. And those friends take up residence. They pull up a chair, maybe kick off their shoes and say, what's today's menu? What are we talking about today? What are we doing today? What's the plan? What's the agenda, Jesus? They take up residence and they choose to live lives where they learn how to abide. Notice what he said. He said, I don't call you a slave. He's talking to disciples because a master wouldn't confide in a slave. Intimacy again. Slave, I ain't telling you my business. I'm not telling you my plans for the future. I'm not telling you what I'm about to do in your ministry. No, no, no. You just work. Blah, 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 in and out. But friends... A secret. Come, I've got something to tell you. Hey, 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 really excited. You know that job promotion you're going for? I've got it for you. It's all good. Hey, come, come, quick, quick, quick. Come downstairs. I want to talk to you. This is what he does with me. I wake up sometimes and it's not even on my agenda to go downstairs and pray. I know, I know you guys are sanctified. Pray for me, okay? <clears throat> I know you pray every day, you're there, six, six, you know, whatever. But there were some days where it was not on my agenda. I'm like, Lord Jesus, I'm just going to work today, okay? But what would happen, I'd wake up early. And this, I got used to now the signs. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're in a relationship, you, you realize, oh, this is what you do when you want my attention. So I'd wake up early, like 15 minutes before my usual spot. And I'm fully awake. Like, no... To fatigue at all. Just, huh. I'm like, ah. Oh. What do you want? <laughs> Hi. Okay. Cool. 
And he says, why don't you come downstairs? That's our little spot, our spot in the front room. This little chair, recline, lovely. <laughs> That's where he met me first in December 2019? 17, one of them. That's where it was, December 23rd, where he met me. And um, right there on that chair. Such a powerful moment that changed my life. So I go back there all the time and I'm going to pray. And we say, come quick, 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 quick. And I'll get there and I'm fully awake. And I'll be like, right, Lord, what do you want to talk about? And I could have only gone to bed three hours earlier. Maybe I was watching some NFL or whatever. Or well, maybe I couldn't even sleep, but I'd wake up fresh. And that's how I know he's got something to tell me. Sometimes it's a song. Sometimes it's a sermon. Sometimes it's just, I just want to tell you how much I love you. And he will spend 45 minutes ravishing me with his love. Just, I just want to tell you. But we also have a deal, right? <laughs> because I didn't say to him, right, you woke me up an hour before my alarm, and I've got work. And these kids at my school, they ain't going to take sympathy because I was with Jesus this morning. <laughs> so I, say, I always say this to him, I say, I'm going to need that energy back. And he, without fail, every time... People, sometimes we get too religious about it. I can't say that to God. Yes, you can, because he cares. Father, look, I love spending this time with you, but I am but a man. <laughs> I need my sleep. Remember your son, he got hungry, he got tired. Yeah, I'm the same. I get hungry, I get tired. You know, it's like when you're doing a fast. Lord, help me get through this next hour, because that biscuit tin, <laughs> there is something about that biscuit tin calling me, right? Uh, maybe not, maybe it's just me. <laughs> That's the cringe, yeah. Right, that's the one. So out of my friendship that I have, I say to him, I really love this time. And I do, generally. I, uh, there was never a moment where I regret the time I spent with him. Trust me, never. There hasn't been. I can safely say that. But I do say to him, just let me know. I'm, I, I do need... I've got like three meetings today. Some parents coming in, they're real tricky. I'm going to need to show up. And without fail, he shows up. I'm going to need some wisdom. Yep, I've got some for you. We spent the whole hour talking about um, end time revival. But when you needed wisdom for that parent who was giving you jib about her son and scholarships or whatever, I was right there. Because you obeyed at six. I'm with you at 12. You didn't even know you needed me because you thought you could take that meeting by yourself. You didn't know what, what angle she was going to come with. And she came with that angle and all the rest of the staff are like, what do we say? And you say this. But, and it completely diffuses the situation. And then the staff, who are not believers, come to you and say, how did you know that? Where did you get that idea from? And you now have the glorious opportunity to say, I've been with Jesus. It makes them uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, Jesus told me. Because they like to think he's this person that's so distant and never ever communicates. No, 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 this is friendship. So I'm with him. This is my reasonable act of worship. Christ-centered worship. Okay, actually, no, before I even get to that, sorry. So in the old, the, uh, the dove would arrive and depart. In the new, he abides. How would you walk if you had a dove on your shoulder? Okay, doves are quite, um, this is Bill Johnson, this is what his, his, he says this. Doves are quite um, nervous creatures. That they, they respond to, to every movement. So how would you walk if you had a dove on your shoulder? You would walk, every step would be conscious of the dove. So where before you might run down some steps, if you've got a dove on your shoulder, you would be careful. You'd be like, So seeing that we have the dove on the inside, how do you walk with the dove on the inside? Every step is conscious of the dove. This is what worship is. It's every, this is how you give everything as your reasonable act of service. In view of God's message, you allow the dove on the inside to dictate every step. John 16, 13 to 15. When the spirit of truth comes, this is talking about this dove. Holy Spirit, 
when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory, Jesus, you know, he will bring Jesus glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. The primary purpose of Holy Spirit is to reveal Christ. Right? And he absolutely loves doing it. Does it all day, every day. He spends all of eternity with us revealing Christ. So Christ-centered worship will always release the manifest presence and power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to see the Holy Spirit move in the church, in power, you want to experience the presence of God like you've never experienced it before, ensure that your worship is Christ-centered. And actually, here's another challenge relating to what I said earlier. Remember I said he loves us, we love because he loved us first. Could you do a whole service where every song was about his love to you. This is for the worship leaders. Right? There's no song that talks about how much you love him. I'm not saying that that's not a valid song. But could you do 45 minutes where all you sing about is his obsession with you? He loves us so well. He loves us. You might have to go into some of the old hymns. Right? Because some of they, they all got it in there. At the cross, at the cross, where am I going? Come on, man. Golden, golden tunes. Truth, truth in lyric. You do that, and you will power the Holy Spirit. Break out. If you build your life in the same way, you will experience the manifest presence and power of the Holy Spirit like you've never experienced before. People ask me all the time, Dave, you know this healing the sick thing that you do? You know, you're really passionate about it. How? What's your secret? And I always say, Holy Spirit. Just, I don't even talk to him much about healing. I spend more time just getting to know him. How he moves. When he goes, he's that way. He's that way. Because he's a wind. The ruach. The breath of God. You chase the wind. Spend every day chasing the wind and learning to hold on to his coattails as he's moving and doing what he does. The last scripture I want to um, refer to is Luke 10, 38, 42. 38 to 42. It's a very common story. We all know it. If you've been in church longer than 18 months, you've probably heard it referenced at some point. Okay. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed, her, welcomed him into her home. Can you imagine? Jesus the Messiah shows up at your yard. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Do you know what that is? That's a prayer. She's talking to the Lord. This is her prayer. She says, isn't it unfair that I'm doing all this work? Tell so-and-so, tell all them lot to come and help me. Because I'm, I'm doing all this stuff for you. I'm preparing a big dinner. Right? Tell her to come and help me. Next verse. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing being worth being concerned about. Say that, one thing. <laughs> Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Do not cook a meal that Jesus never ordered. Don't be obsessed with doing things that he doesn't want you to do. When he says sit, Sit. Mike Bickle said it. There are two types of people in the kingdom of God. There are lovers and workers, but it's the lovers that get all the work done. If you can learn to just be a lover, to learn how to minister to him, to adore him, 
to choose the better option, to discover the truth of just sitting with him, more than doing everything else. There will come a time where he will release you to do other stuff. And Mary probably ended up, you know, doing things at some point. But the better option and the one thing worth being concerned about in this instance was to sit at his feet as he taught. Unfortunately, especially pre-pandemic, but even still to a certain point, we built our church around being busy. And the place of solace, the place of peace, the place of rest became a place of work where we are defined by the lanyards and the badge around our, our neck. Worship pastor. The servant leader. And it's all well and good. We need these offices to exist in order to help the navigation of a church service. I get it. So I'm not bashing that. I'm not saying you lot should all rip it up and get me into trouble with your pastor next week. What happened to all my servant leaders? They revolted. No, 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 no. It's not that. What I'm saying is if you place your value in your servant leadership, you got it wrong. If you place your value in how many songs you can lead, you got it wrong. If you place your value in how much prayer you've done this month or how much fasting you've done this month, you've got it wrong. Because your value should be your nearness to Jesus. And every day, inch even closer to his feet. It's interesting because a few chapters later, Mary then, she comes in, she breaks her alabaster box over the feet of Jesus. The same feet that she sat at just a few chapters earlier. Her obsession or her reality of his obsession with her pulled her even closer that she would even wash his feet. I'm very excited because I know there are people here who've been waiting and wanting to get closer to his feet. But the activity of being a Christian has got in the way. And you have found reasons to not sit, to not find rest. Like I said, I'm not telling you to get rid of all your rotors and whatever. I'm telling you where the value should be found. And if you are to carry what the Lord is about to bless this place with, you will need to learn how to sit at the feet and not be cooking meals and in the kitchen when God is moving in the front room. Okay? You are going to need to learn it because you're going to have to chase the wind. And I'm saying this prophetically because I understand where the Lord is pushing you guys. And I felt it, me and Brother Sam, we felt it last year when we were here. That he's pushing you into something. He's doing it all across the whole city. Okay, people? I can't even tell you some of the stuff <laughs> that's going on. And I'm talking about some really established voices saying, London is next. London is next. And it doesn't mean Wembley Arena. It means your road. Your road can be saved for Jesus because you chose to get up and just sit with him. And all of a sudden, the power of God just starts to hit house after house. I've told you this story already. Um, and then what we're going to do, we just want to host him for a little bit. Okay? I just want to host him for a little bit. Um, we prayed a prayer years ago about our house. And we said, Father, sickness stops at the door. There was no sickness in this house. And there was a time where I was at work. And I got really ill really quickly. To the point I had to come home early. I only live 10 minutes away from the, from the school. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to get home. I need to sleep. I, need to, like, I don't know whether it was a headache or I can't remember what it was. But I just felt ill. I remember I walked in to the house. And I, know, I got changed or whatever. And I'm lying on the bed. And <laughs> Denise texts me. And she was like, how are you feeling? And I went, you know what, actually, I'm all right, you know. <laughs> I'm not as bad as I, I was an hour ago. I didn't even realize. And then she turned around and said, well, yeah, remember we prayed. Sickness stops at the door. Okay, cool, that's what happens. Sickness stops at the door. We got stories. <laughs> right. Just in silence. 
Christmas is hosted. Some of you are going to feel a sensation. Some of you, maybe your hands start burning. Some of you may hear a new tongue. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, cause the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts. Some of you might have a moment where you just feel slightly overwhelmed. And the love of God begins to make you want to tear up and cry. It's okay. Some of you will get random flashes of tingles and like he's moving through breath of God breathe on us breath of God breathe on us yes breath of God Father we wait we wait we wait Jesus we wait Jesus. Blessed be your name. There's a few things the Lord showed me this morning. I just want to just, if you guys are stay connected, stay connected, don't worry. Does anyone have any pain in their neck, the neck area? Maybe someone in the room might be someone who's going to watch this later. Does anyone have any pain in their neck area? Which side? Okay. Oh man. Father, I thank you for your healing power. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. The power of God is present to heal. We remove all pain in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Um, this is quite a sensitive one, so if you want to just I don't know, raise a hand or nod or something. Um, someone who maybe has stomach cramps, but I believe it's linked to an eating disorder. Not saying it's the eating disorder you currently have, but maybe something that happened when you were younger. And sometimes you get stomach cramps, or you used to get stomach cramps. Is anyone in the room? Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to your name. Thank you, Father, for your healing power. Heal up us. Anxiety. Anyone had an anxiety attack or panic attack in the last week or so? Thank you, Father. Father, we just release your peace 
Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for raising your hand. Father, we just release your peace right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and overwhelm them with peace. And I bring to an end the cycle of anxiety attacks, panic attacks, worry in the name of Jesus. Does anyone have bone pain at the top of their chest? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for your healing power. It's even now a sweep in this room. Sweep in this room. Young lady with a camera. What's your name? Cammy. And when I was, um, I saw you taking pictures earlier, and I'm always now prepared for it because you caught me in some moments. But the Lord said to me, He said, to remind, to tell you something that He said to me years ago. When water flows through a pipe, the pipe gets wet. Okay? And sometimes it's very easy to think you're on the outside of things because you're, you're doing things in church. And, and I don't want you to stop because you have a gift. And the Lord is going to accelerate that gift. But he wanted to encourage you because when it hits and it breaks out, you're going to feel like, yeah, but Lord, I want to I wanna be touched. I'm here taking pictures of people getting set free. I'm here documenting the revival, and we need people to do that. So your role is crucial, okay? Because just like John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all of them, you will be documenting what the Lord is doing, okay? It's not just pictures. It's not just images and visuals, whatever. You're documenting the move of God. But as water flows through the pipe, the pipe gets wet. As he flows through, you yourself will be blessed, okay? So remember that every time. Father, we give you praise. You can play if you want. Father, we give you praise. So guys, as simple as that, as simple as that, in 2017 when he showed up, my words were very simple. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. This morning, the words were very simple. Come, Holy Spirit. And he always shows up. It's not for us to overthink, not for us to get too complicated and anything like that. But just to still yourself and allow the presence of God just to rise and make itself manifest. The reality of the situation is, guys, he doesn't come down. You know, we always say, you know, Holy Spirit, come down. He's already here. It's make manifest. It's reveal more than come down. I think Isaiah says it, the heavens were rent open and he came down. The heavens weren't <laughs> put back, up, back together. Like, he's here. So my prayer is not come, you know, hit this room or what I just say, reveal yourself because I know you're here already. Because he's waiting. And he's, he's waiting at the side of your bed. He's waiting in your prayer closet. He's waiting at your workplace. He's waiting in all these places. And the moment you learn and we make a collective decision as family to step into this 24-7 relationship and friendship and engagement where you're always open to his leading, you'll see even more in our day than we've ever seen before. And we've seen a lot. There have been a lot of moves of God. From Azusa onwards, Brownsville, the Bay of the Holy Spirit revival, Carolina. He's moved a lot. In this nation, this nation is full of revival. Look at the history. Like, there was one in Wales, the Welsh revival, which actually launched Pentecostalism, if you track it. Okay. So a lot of our story begins in the revivals that hit this nation. But the one critique, as it were, is that no one learned how to sustain a revival from one generation to the next. It would always start 
and it will end with that generation. It is my life's mission to ensure that when he shows up, and he's here, but when we start to see it in its fullness, that we are able to pass it on. And the way to do that is to train ourselves, train our spouses, train our households, train our kids, our grandkids, how to host the presence of God. Because that never goes out of fashion. He might be opening deaf ears in one generation and his blind eyes the next, but it's the same hosting of the Holy Spirit. Okay? This has to be our central thing that we learn just to Father, I thank you for the ministry of your spirit. I thank you for the appetite that you're wetting. That your people, as those that are here and those that will watch later on, will have this desire to host you like they've never hosted before. And I thank you because that will propel these people into places I will never go, into situations I will never be able to impact. And it means that you will be there. And when you're there, you bring reconciliation, you bring restoration, you bring healing. So I thank you. Because your influence and your kingdom is expanding with every heart that you set on fire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning into today's session. I am sure you were encouraged, you were edified, you were convicted, you were all types of things that led you to being edified in Christ. I want to also just give you an opportunity, if you've been blessed in any way, to help support the ministry through giving. Um, this would be a perfect time for you just to, you know, water the, the plant that's been feeding you some good word in the season of your life. So I want to bless you and thank you in advance in supporting us and also invite you to follow us on All Things Social in New Thing London, London being LDS. I look forward to seeing you on the journey.